give talks. So I like to involve the audience. Is anyone, was anyone here in Indianapolis or no? So if you do, you'll remember. I like to get people involved. If someone falls asleep, I'll probably walk over them, wake them up, give them a cup of water or whatever else. So I like to have fun when I speak. I think it's more entertaining and the more you know, captive the audience is, the better it is for everyone. So um, who here knows someone with fibromyalgia or suffers from fibromyalgia? So raise your hands up again, loud and clear. It's like at least half the room, right? So what do you guys, you know, what do you, what do you know about fibromyalgia? I'll just throw it out to you. Okay, who else? So pain, obviously. We're, we're going to get into all this about midway through, but who else? Go ahead. I have a friend, she said she just hit dead end after dead end with doctors, so then they ended up saying she had fibro because they didn't have answers. Right, so it's like a disease of exclusion, right? You go to a doctor, they don't know what it is, and they say, does it hurt here? Do you have stomach problems? Do you have this and that? And a whole bunch of cluster of different symptoms. And then they go, oh, well, we don't know what it is. This isn't working, so it's fibromyalgia. It's kind of like, oh, now I have a condition. They named it. Because if you go to a doctor and you don't get a name for your condition, a lot of times you're like, well, what's wrong with me? I don't know what's wrong with you. And then you kind of feel like the doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. Where in a lot of cases, sometimes it's better if they don't know what they're talking about. Know, they don't give you something that may not be true. Anyone else want to comment before we get going or now? Inflammation. Inflammation. Okay, so the pain inflammation route, obviously, that's a big one. And ding, 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 CBD. So uh, that's a big one. Anyone else or now ready to roll? Okay. Um, I'm going to put this slide up here. This is a, this is a growing of you guys QR code this. Um, I put a lot of studies on here. This is on our website, and I'll be adding to that shortly as I compile. I do a lot of research. Um, I'm currently in 21 years in practice. You'll see that in a second as a sports chiropractor. But um, you know, with Noetic, I do a lot of product formulation and development and whatnot. So um, I like putting studies up, because people always come to me, and the doctors I work with and my patients like, yeah, do you have a study on this? Or Tara, do you have a study on this? So what we're going to do is build a pretty large comprehensive database of all different conditions. Uh, and research uh, with CBD, which I think is important to have. Um, so again, the topic for today, did everyone get that? Or no, who wanted it? You just stick your phone on it, the picture, and it will just, you'll grab it, and it'll ask you to open it up, and then you just save that page or whatever, bookmark it, and you'll have it forever. Go back to it in a couple weeks, there'll be more studies on there. I'm gonna start building that up very quickly. Ready to roll? Okay. By the way, if I speak too fast, too slow, you guys need to hear something again. We're in a small enough group here. It's a small enough group. Just yell out. Don't, don't feel funny. Don't like sit in the corner and worry about it. You know, let's, we're here to learn. We're doing it together. So let's have some fun. Um, how CBD can help with fibromyalgia and other pain diseases. Okay, that's obviously why we're here. Uh, that's me and uh, Alan Madison. <laughs> that's who I am. I throw a picture in there. Uh, owner of, Advanced, of Columbia Advanced Chiropractic for 21 years. Uh, highly trained in most uh, forms of physical medicine. Um, I'm actually at Jefferson University in Philly for working on a master's in cannabinoid sciences. I'm the chief, chief uh, science officer for, uh, for Noetic Nutraceuticals. Um, I'm a sports diplomate in my field. So I have a lot of experience working with athletes, uh, professional, amateur, and uh, again, 21 years in the field. So I have, do a lot with, I have a hyperbaric chamber, dry needling, active release, if any of you know who that, what that is, uh, grass and technique, you name it, cold laser. So I'm very big into really anything that affects pain, inflammation, and gets people better. So obviously CBD is a nice chemical way to go, whereas everything else is more of a physical approach or, neuro or a neurological approach. That's my family. That's why I do what I do. That's my wife. That's little Mila. Mila, raise your hand. She can't hear anyone. She's in the corner over there because she had to come with me because my wife's getting deployed. She's an army doctor. Uh, that's Marin, and that's Marlo. That's us at Disney World a couple years ago. So whoever has family, doesn't have family, whatever, it's cool to have a family, but um, they're cute little critters. All right, vitals about the company and what's going on. This is Bill, Bill Diker. He's downstairs right now. Did anyone hear me, Bill? Anyone know him? Go talk to him. He's a great guy. He, you'll probably see him on American Ninja Warrior eventually. He's an absolute nut freak athlete. Um, if you're looking here, he, this is him rock climbing, pretty much free climbing. That is not a GoPro. That's a truck. On, that's a truck. I didn't realize that when I first looked at it. I said, oh, he's got a GoPro on his head. That's kind of cool. That's an actual truck. He's nuts. Uh, this guy skis like almost jumps out of helicopters. So um, he came to me, I'm his chiropractor, so he came to me a couple years ago and uh, was out at Steamboat on a charity skiing event and uh, hurt his shoulder really bad and uh, didn't know what to do. Went to a dispensary or something out there, I guess, uh, wherever he went, some store, and got a, salve, a CBD salve to put on it. And I don't recall if it was a THC blind, but I think it was primarily CBD is what he talks about. And it really helped the shoulder pain a lot. And he came back to me and he said, Alan, you got, Doc, you got to get into this. All right, well, at the time, a couple years ago, what was CBD, in, you know, what was it? It's a Schedule One drug, right? So does anyone here, by definition, know what a Schedule One drug is? Anyone, a venture, a guess? Did it have no medicinal value? 100%. It 
That's why you can't do anything with it. 100%, it has zero medicinal value. When we say something is a Schedule One drug, it has zero medicinal value. So what does that mean? You can't do research on it. Well, you have to go through Mississippi to do it. It's very difficult. But you also can't transport it, use it. It's basically in the same category as heroin, cocaine, and everything else. Well, what's kind of cool is that with CBD now, we all know what schedule is it now. Has anyone been giving talks on this or now today? It's now Schedule Five. And that's probably because of the Epidiolex that's coming out, which is an FDA approved drug. Well, the FDA can't approve a Schedule One drug for use and prescription use and everything else, right? So they had to reschedule it, which is great for all of us in here and everyone working in CBD, which is wonderful. But back at the time, we're going to go back now, a couple years, CBD was, again, a Schedule One. So I couldn't do anything with it. So I don't want to lose my license as a doctor. You know, there's medical, medical marijuana is coming along, medical cannabis, not much with CBD in Maryland. Maryland's a pretty liberal state with stuff, which is great on that. But there wasn't a lot. I was very afraid to get involved with this. I said, hey, I'll lose my license. This could be dangerous to me. So Bill nagged me for about six months. No joke. Every time he come in, oh, you got to do whatever. Finally, he gave me an ultimatum. Either you help me with it or I'll find someone else who will. So I spoke to, I spoke to my father-in-law as an attorney and went through a lot of things and did a lot of research. And I said, I'm in because as a chiropractor, we're supposed to be very open-minded. We're very holistic with our approach. And this goes you know, along the mental, chemical, structural side of what we're doing. It like, fits in like, perfectly. And the rest is history. Best, one of the best moves I've ever made in my life. So um, before we get going and we get into fibromyalgia, who here thinks that they have a strong grasp on the endocannabinoid system and how CBD works and everything else? Does everyone like, really know how things work in the body and how everything functions? Yeah, you're, you, you do? So I can quiz you the whole time through? Um, no, let's do it. OK, let's do it. OK, good. <laughs> I like the confidence, though. All right, cool. So most people have a dysfunctional endocannabinoid system. We'll get into that. Your endocannabinoid system, what's that? You, if you can spell it, you will eventually get points. So it'll be a spelling test. And yeah, after, after there's a sort of quiz. Just kidding. Um, actually, you have to write like a, like a journal entry. That's what I'm doing right now in my class. But anyway, they get long. Um, system of bliss. Okay? It, it affects it really the endocannabinoid system. The best way I describe it to people is when people get really old, not like my age old, but like really old, what, what do people usually say? They become kind of like curmudgeons, right? They kind of come grumpy and whatever. What do you think that's really due to, just because they're old? What does it do to? Their endocannabinoid system's dead. Well, they may be in pain or dysfunction, but guess what? Their neurological system isn't working as well as it used to. When you have a neurodegenerative disease, is your neurological system working the way it should? No, right? So, I mean, think about when people get ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's, or MS. It can happen when you're a little younger. Um, or Parkinson's. These are usually affecting what? Usually not 12, 15, 16, 18-year-olds, but older people, right? And there are a lot of reasons. We can get into free radical damage, uh, into other drugs that have affected the neurological system. But the endocannabinoid system plays into those and benefits them. Part of the reason is, as we age, things start breaking down. And what do we really do to address our bodies, and especially in this country, as things break down? What do we do? Nothing until we're broken. Right? If someone was to say to you, you're going to have a heart attack in a year, you'd probably do something about it now. I better start eating better. Uh, I better start exercising more. Um, I better start you know, yada, yada, whatever you're going to do. But most people just wait for the heart attack because they don't know a year in advance that they're going to have one. So prevention is huge. Okay? So we want to keep that endocannabinoid system working really well. It balances everything out. It's not a pseudoscience. It's hard science. When we talk about CBD, you can speak about it with confidence because it's legit. There are studies on it. All over the world, the United States is far behind. Okay, but you'll learn a lot from me today, and there's a lot more that you can learn about. Um, you know, uh, what's that? NBC News, one in six Americans take antidepressants. Um, let me see. How many people is that in the country? Do you have a calculator? Well, we have 320 million people, one in six. What does that come out to? It's over 50 million, isn't it? Is that right? I mean, think about how many people are taking antidepressants, psych psychotropic drugs. Why? Why is everyone taking psychotropic drugs? because our brains are lacking the drugs, or there's something that's happening that we can't process very well or handle very well anymore, and therefore we're being given drugs so we at least don't go crazy, right? Part, again, part of the endocannabinoid system plays into that. Here's another one. It's a little bit uh, light in here, hard to see. I don't know, can we hit the lights in the back at all or no? I mean, for the front area? If possible. If, if possible. If not, it's OK. 70% of Americans take prescription drugs. Researchers on antibiotics, antidepressants, pain-killing opioids are the most commonly prescribed. You know, we're going to see this over and over and over again. Okay? We are a heavily medicated society, over-medicated for sure. So we've got to open up our minds. And we have to see what's going on out there, and that's why everyone's here right now. So as I get into this, it's a 45-minute talk. If you guys can't tell, because I flap a lot, I could probably talk for hours. 
But again, even though I'm very exciting, uh, you would all eventually fall asleep. So we won't go that long. We'll go take this into lunch, and we'll be done. We are going to discuss the endocannabinoid system. I did this when we were in Indianapolis because it's hard to talk about a disease process if you don't understand how the body works in the first place, right? Before you can establish abnormal, or we would say in chiropractic, AB normal, you have to know what normal is, right? You don't look at an x-ray and try to figure something out unless you know what a bone normally looks like or in a joint space and soft tissue. And then you can identify, oh, that doesn't look like the normal one. And then we go from there. So it's very important to understand how the endocannabinoid system works, at least on a basic level, okay? What CBD is and how CBD works. That's well, we're, we're all here for that. Why it is important for us. What is fibromyalgia? We will cover that. How CBD can help with FM and how CBD helps with other pain diseases. And I'll let you all know about three or four nights ago, I revamped the entire last one third of my entire talk because a new study came out, which I think is fascinating and I wanted to share with you guys. I hope you appreciate it because it gets really into the gist of what the entire discussion is in a case study. So it's very scientific. Um, the endocannabinoid system, and uh, I'm losing a little bit down here. I don't know if you, can you guys make the screen a little smaller or now? Can that be done? No? Because I can't do anything on my end with that, so we can catch the bottom. If we look at the endocannabinoid system, let's just think of six things. If, if this is all you know about it, you probably know more than 99.99% of the population. Two receptors, two endocannabinoids, let's call those neurotransmitters, and two enzymes. That's it that we know right now. There's more. We're not getting into vanilla receptors. We're not getting into more G protein receptors. We're going to stick with CB1 and CB2 as our receptors. We all know about them. Or we're going to find and learn more about them in a moment. Two endocannabinoids, which are anatomide and 2-AG. And then two enzymes, OK? Fatty acid amide hydrolase and monoacyl gly glycerol lipase, OK? You're going to find out in a second as we go into it. And any questions along the way, throw a hand up, OK? Because I'm here to answer all this stuff. OK, this is from the study that I'm going to be going over later. FOS critical enzyme for the breakdown of a range of bioactive lipids. It breaks things down, OK? So when we have FA in the system, it's eating away at the endocannabinoid, primarily anatomide. MAGL, glycerol lipase, eats away at 2-AG. So we have these receptors. If the receptors get the neurotransmitters to interact with them, then we get the effect. If the, if the receptors are not getting anything to interact with them, then what happens to the system? It doesn't work, right? So that's what we're looking at. So where is CB1 found primarily? It's all over the place. But primarily, brain, central nervous system, and organs. When you think of the CB1 receptor, traditionally, someone who smokes marijuana or takes or vapes it or whatever they're going to use, you think of the T CB1 receptors with the THC hits. THC acts like an atomide, but it's not self-regulating. So when, you, when we take CBD or we take, we'll get into that a little bit, but when I mean not self-regulating, what I'm saying is you can't control when the THC goes in. It hits the receptor, it goes beyond what your body can normally ca handle, and then you get high from it. It's not self-modulating. Whereas when we work in the realm of CBD, it's entirely self-modulating, which is fascinating because there are side effects to THC that CBD does not have. But the CB1 receptor, of course, will govern anxiety, depression, mood disorders, brain function, everything along that line. The CB2 receptors are mostly found in the peripheral nervous system and the immune system. Okay? Think about this for a second. The immune system. What, are, what, what does the immune system do? When we think of the immune system, what do we primarily think about? All right, disease, right? Disease, what else? That's primarily what we think about, right? Immune system, what, we have spleen, we have uh, other lymphatic organs, you know, or we've got a CBC, so, you know, our immune system, what's that? Uh, neutrophils, lymphocytes, mono, what, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, you know, wow, this is all great stuff. So the immune system, but the immune system modulates pain and inflammation in the body. It's not just attacking diseases. And that's where the CBD comes in, okay? Because we are affecting the CB2 receptor that's affecting the immune system. So ding, 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 originally it was thought, hey, CBD really only affects CB2 on the level of modulating pain and inflammation. But the newer studies are also showing, hey, it can actually start building up your immune system, which would be great for illness. So that's yet to come. There's still research coming out on that. Uh, this is a picture, as I said, I'm in a master's program at Jefferson. Um, so I'm giving them credit so I can use this. But this is kind of neat. We have some cannabinoids in here. We have an immune cell. It's basically showing the CB2 receptor, grabbing the cannabinoid. And then we'll get the immune cell function. The CB1 on the end of a neuron, free nerve ending, there we go. There's a CB1 receptor getting the cannabinoid. 
here. And it's basically signaling how everything's working. The endocannabinoids, endo, means what? Cannabinoids. Well, we know what cannabinoids are, right? Endo. Basically, we're making them. We're making them. Okay? We make anatomide. Does anyone know the history of anatomide? Arachidonyl ethanolamine. Pretty big word. There's your spelling. That you have to know that in five minutes. Okay. To arachidonyl glycerol. Yes, everything has nice acronyms in this. You know, everything's got cute little lettering and everything. Um, anatomide, Sanskrit. What's it mean? Bliss. And this was identified back uh, by Raphael uh, Mechiolam in Israel and their whole group, which and they're still getting this guy since the 80s. He's still amazing. You know, this is the name of our endocannabinoid. THC mimics that. So it works on primarily CB1 receptors. There's a little crossover, but uh, similar to THC. 2-AG is the 2-arachidonic glycerol. It works on CB1 and CB2 receptors. It's similar to CBD. But we have to remember that CBD works indirectly. It does not work directly. We said THC, you smoke marijuana, okay, uh, it hits the CB1 receptor, okay, you get the receptor effects from it, and then you can't regulate it, so you get high from it. CB2 can't make you high, can it? Is there anyone who's ever gotten, uh, you know, um, a psychoactive, true psychoactive or intoxicating effect from CBD? Anything documented anywhere? Because there's nothing in the literature. It can't happen because it's a self-limiting. So our body's going to control that mechanism. It's really fascinating how it works. Uh, pharmacological effects of cannabinoids, activation of C1, CB1, CB2. This is all research-based. Again, I'm learning this in my master's program. So, I mean, it's right in there. Pain suppression. CB1, CB2 effect is a great slide, by the way. Perception changes, pain perception. Muscle relaxation, CB1, because what? It affects, what, the brain? When you take, when you take a, a muscle relaxant, what is it affecting? GABA levels in the brain. Interesting, right? So anti-inflammatory, CB1, and we know maybe CB1, it is CB2 primarily. Anxiety, CB1 brain. Anti-seizure, CB1 brain. Uh, you know, when we talk about anti-seizure and CBD, what, what disease do we like to talk about a lot? Epilepsy, right? Okay. So um, attention, motor impairment, CB1, tolerance, dependence, withdrawal, all these things are CB1. Can we affect all these with CBD? Yes. Cool. Okay, we'll touch on THC because you know it's uh, it's in there, right? We either have everything that we're doing in this with today is either going to be a full spectrum primarily, which is going to include THC, okay, or it's going to be a broad spectrum, which is everything but the THC, even if we get into other cannabinoids. Um, THC does have side effects. I recommend everyone read about them. So it's not a free lunch. It does have about a nine to ten percent addiction rate. My concern. And I have a lot of patients who use medical marijuana because I'm in Maryland and it's readily available and not, not too difficult to get is back in the day, a couple hundred years ago, when in the United States people were smoking medical marijuana or medical cannabis, we'll call it just cannabis back in the day, what percentage THC was it? Anyone want to throw a guess out? What's that? Three or four percent. Any other guesses? Two percent. It's like, it's like a, was it a rent not a raffle? It's like a, hey, who gets another? About five to eight percent. Um, but what percent was it was the CBD in it? So let's say you had eight percent THC, you'd like one percent CBD. So that's about an eight to one ratio. Okay. All right. So now we look at our industry because this is exactly what we're doing, all of us in here, and we look at industrial hemp. And what is that being grown for? Right. What percentage CBD can we get up to now? Twenty. 16, 20, 22, 24, it keeps going up, right? But let's look at the other side of that. Let's look at the medical cannabis side. What, is, what are they doing with their THC levels? The plants are going up, what, 30% and plus and above? And what are they purposely knocking out? The CBD. So maybe there's a correlation between having a little CBD, a little THC, or balancing those out instead of eliminating one completely. Because we know that the CBD benefits THC function Okay? It can actually kind of counter some of the side effects of the THC. So I get all my medical marijuana patients who are taking loads of THC, and it's very liberal in Maryland. They, get a, they don't get a dose amount when they get a, an ID card. They basically get a certain like, limit that they can use. But from people I've interviewed on it, because I had to do that for my class, I mean, uh, one, one gentleman told me, um, I could smoke uh, marijuana six hours a day, every day of the month, and still have enough over for all my friends. Think about it. You know, but they don't take the, C the CBD. They're just pounding the THC. So it's nice to get the CBD in there. It's a better balance. It can actually counteract some of the effects. But the plant originally had both. And now what they're doing is they're breeding the plant in the THC side so just to have the THC. Maybe not the best thing. That's my point on that. So CBD in the endocannabinoid system. It taps into the endocannabinoid system. 
Okay? It alters concentrations of neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters are the anatomide and the 2-AG. Where does CBD come from? Well, guess what? I'm showing it to you. Alphatolic acid and geronol pyrophosphate. These are in the plants. Okay? CBGA is where it all starts. Anyone here familiar with CBG? Everyone's like, I really want to get CBG. That's great. There's very little research on CBG. CBG is like the mother. Like it's like the, you know, it's the parent of all the other ones. But we don't really know enough about it. There's a little bit. You'll see a chart that I have. Uh, but CBGA, or synthases are basically enzymes, breaks down into THCA, CBDA, and CBCA. What are the ones we primarily hear about? Not much over here, right? Because it's new research. Okay. With UV light or heat, which means, guess what? The plant is growing outside. It's going to get light. It's going to get water. It's going to be usually warm. What happens? Okay, it breaks down. That's how we get THC, CBD, and CBC. And we look at this THC and the CBD as the main players, and that's really the focus of the talk is the CBD. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. Everyone will be tested on this at the end of today. Okay. <laughs> this is from Trends in, Phar in uh, Pharmacological Sciences, volume 30, number 10. I have, it, I have a study. I think it was a 2009 study. I have it. Uh, this is CBD. It's going to tell you everything that it has effects with and through what pathway. Then you see THCV, CBG, CBC, everything else, THCA, Test CBD. One, two, okay. That's a great Did chart because it kind of gives you, you know, I, I formulate products. I love to know when I'm putting something in there, what effect it's going to have on the system, especially through studies. Test. So this is a really neat thing to look at and understand because guess what? There's bone stimulant properties. And there are studies with bone healing in CBD. Kind of cool, right? Who would think that? Well, unless you do a study on it or you have a whole bunch of patients telling you something, it's, you wouldn't really know, right? So it's, you need to get this. So you look at all these things here, like, wow, what is not affected in the body by the neurological system? What, gut, what controls everything? The neurological system. So this is a major part of our neurological system. CBD works in two ways. This is kind of cool. Okay, CBD reduces those enzymes. It literally eats away at them. FAAH, MAGL. Okay? It eats them. It reduces them in our body. It's a wonderful thing. Okay? They're naturally created during high stress. Who here does not have stress? Does anyone here think that they have a properly functioning atom? Hands down. Uh, hand down. Is there anyone who thinks that they have a properly functioning endocannabinoid system all the time? Or even most of the time? Does anyone here not have stress? You just walked in here. You're late. No way, man. You're stressed out for walking in here late. And now I'm picking you on you, and you're sitting there, so you have to be stressed out. So no, you're not. I'm just kidding. Um, so when we're looking at this, no one really. Does everyone sleep eight solid hours a night? Does anyone here have kids? If you have kids, forget it. You're doomed. Um, is anyone here exercising regularly, eating properly, you know, looking at uh, you know, your basal metabolic rate for caloric load, intermittent fast and caloric restriction? I mean, how many people are really working on this regularly or to the levels that they need to? No one. And that's why we're aging and the endocannabinoid system is dropping down. Okay? So uh, these enzymes are produced. And guess what? They hang out and then they eat away at what? These two. And then we become deficient with our endocannabinoid system. But hello, CBD comes in there, eats away the enzymes. And guess what? Now our natural levels of anatomine and, and uh, 2-AG go up. As they go up, they interact with the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. And guess what? Then our endocannabinoid system is working better. If I had a mic, I'd like drop it and just like walk off the stage because that's really all this is about. Okay? If your endocannabinoid system is working, that means that the, the self-modulating system or the homeostatic mechanism of your brain is functioning. Every system gets affected by that. The one thing we should not do with CBD, we don't want to get kind of pigeonholed into this, and the FDA, USDA is kind of looking that way, is, is CBD a drug? Do we want CBD to be a drug? Does anyone in this room want CBD to be a drug? No, because who's going to come in? Pharmaceuticals, oh, we own it. We're going we're gonna to patent every process. We're going to do everything with it. Um, you know, they didn't do it at St. John's Ward. Think about all the other things out there that aren't drugs, yet have effects on the brain and everything else. CBD is a plant form, right? It's a botanical. Okay? It has drug-like effects, but it's not really a drug. I mean, for that matter, any vitamin or supplement or any plant form, anything you take, should be a drug. So we have to really be a little protective with what we're doing because you know, we don't want it to be mis mislabeled. You know, it shouldn't really be labeled as a drug. So everything's self-modulating. Uh, here's a discussion over here. The highlight isn't coming out very well. But uh, just to prove the point, um, uh, the ability of uh, cannabidiol to inhibit the phi activity and enhance intrinsic anatomide signaling uh, might be a, func a uh, functionally relevant component of its antipsychotic properties. So again, FAAH you know, and anatomide and, and CBD reducing that, that, reduce that reduces that. So if we knock out the phi, we add the, uh, the cannabidiol, then the anatomy works better, and we get less psychotic issues. Great. 
Um, THC, by the way, can create psychotic issues if we're not careful. But there's another way, a little bit newer in the research. CBD is also a negative allosteric modulator of the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. What does that mean? It can bind in a different spot. Forget CB1 and CB2. Hey, there's another, there's another receptor out there. There might be two or three more receptors. There might be 10, but we just don't know yet. So there's another way that it works. And we know that because it lessens the effects of the anatomide in the 2-AG. Okay? So th those are the two ways that it works. And there's a study from where? It was a British, I can't read the top of it there because it's too light. British Journal of something, right? And so, uh, and this is, I think, 2015 or 16, 2015. And here you have it down at the bottom. So you can read about how that works. So everything I talk about, I have to have a study. Uh, that's what happens when you're married to a physician. You have to prove everything. So uh, that's how it works. So what is important for us? We're down to number three. We're getting there. Our endocannabinoid system is on demand. What does that mean? This is so cool. That's why you'll see like the last third of this, like, like my talk is like really neat. Um, wh what is so cool about it being on demand or not cool? What does that mean? It, who said that? Oh, hi. Um, yes, we use it when we need it. It's on demand. It goes on, we use it, we activate, it shuts off. Makes sense, right? Would we want something running all the time? Or what would happen if it did run all the time? Well, we're going to find out because there's a good case study on that. It goes on and off and it's homeostatic. But we need endocannabinoids in the body at all times. We only do not need endocannabinoids in the body if our endocannabinoid system is working perfectly and we don't have elevated levels of what? FA and MAGL. Okay? If you could test and find out that your MAGL levels and your FA levels are low, you're probably creating enough anatomine into AG, you'd be fine. But no one has that going on. So adding that CBD in or adding in ways to boost the endocannabinoid system, CBD being obviously the best, um, or one of the best, um, is the way to go. So the CBD in the endocannabinoid system, a little bit of review here. It upregulates or activates it. It's the master homeostatic mechanism. If it works, you function better. If, you, if it does not work, your endocannabinoid system, you do not work well, period. Okay? The two ways it works, it eats the enzymes, and it's a negative allosteric modulator. Okay? Let's get into the other topic here that everyone's very interested in, fibromyalgia. Okay, we talked a little bit about it. Pain, 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 and more pain. More like a neurological pain, right? People, what's the difference between someone with FM and if you don't have it and you're sitting here when you have pain? What's the difference? Take someone who's fibromyalgia and poke them. And then when they say, ouch, poke them again. And when they go to swing at you, stop poking them, please. But, um, you know, what's going on with these people? If someone touches your back or hits an area, should it hurt? Yeah, she said nerve endings, so you see it in here, our nerve endings are on fire. The body's inflamed, right? It's a separate, what we call allodynia. Something that does not normally cause pain is creating pain. Because our system is like ramped up. The best, this was told to me like years ago. I can't even remember where I learned, where I learned this. But um, imagine having a glass of wine and it's like, you know, half full, you know, and, and you get some stress. Like your, your system's like that is what I'm saying. Not just the glass of wine you want to drink. But, uh, you know, you get certain stressors and the wine level might go up a little bit. So with FM, it's like starting at the top and everything just overflows. So when it overflows, it creates all types of problems, physical, mental, everything else. Um, we also have something called hyperalgesia. So let's say you have an area where, let's say most people have an area like in the upper middle scap area that's usually sore and tight from poor posture. Probably everyone in here, I'm a chiropractor, you can probably find that on most of you. Um, and we poke and prod that and you go, oh, it feels sore and sensitive. Yeah, that's my bad spot. I slept funny last night, whatever else. You touch these people, they scream and want to turn around and bite your finger off. So that's different from allodynia. Allodynia is pain where pain doesn't exist. This is, you have a little bit of discomfort, but in these people it's like ramped up a lot. Okay, that's FM in a nutshell, okay? Tiredness, morning stiffness, sleep, emotional disturbances. Forget reading it, just look at the picture, okay? Symptoms of fibromyalgia. These are all the things that people tend generally have with FM. And it might be one or two or three, it might be all of them. I mean, again, I've been in the field 21 years, I've dealt with probably hundreds and thousands of FM patients. Um, the original research that was done on FM like years ago, back in the 80s or 90s, was, was moth-eaten Z fibers. Does anyone, know, does anyone remember or know what those are? In the muscle tissue? Basically what it means is almost epoxy of the muscle. So some stress or some issues basically trapping down the tissue, not letting enough nutrient flow and oxygen to get in, and then there's basically breakdown of the tissue. That's really all they've really been able to show uh, with that. And they're always looking for new ways to test it and new blood work and, and everything else. So how's it caused? And again, we're missing that bottom line down here. I apologize. Um, but I wonder if we can lift the projectors a little bit more, maybe. Someone lift it. Up, just uh, possibly a little bit, maybe not. Um, disorder of the central processing, perception of pain as we touched on, high level substance P, pain, 
low blood flow to parts of the brain, so there's a brain effect. Serotonin and tryptophan, uh, which also relax the system. Cytokine function, you know, everything else. I mean, the, the body's just not working right with FM. Oh. You know what? Drop that. There's going to be a little thing in front that drops that little that down. Yes. Just a tad in your, that's perfect. I think that, whoop, a little bit more. There should be a little button for that that you hit in or something that will drop that down. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so no one really knows if it's, is it a slow onset where it's neurological damage over time? Or is it fast, illness or injury that damages the body? Could be both, right? We could have an underlying neurological issue, then we get in a bad car accident, and, and that's it. Um, we could have a death of a close relative, and that creates tremendous stress, overrides the endocannabinoid system, and it ceases to function the way it should. Okay. There's no diagnosis specifically for FM. Now, you see this, FMA? That's a test. It's, debate. it's being debated right now. They say, oh, there's a new blood test. It works 100%, whatever, but it's not really showing that that's the case. Uh, widespread pain over three months is what they normally go with. There's a, no medical reason for the pain. I have pain for three months. I heard hearing, and I have stomach problems. All those are the symptoms. Can't figure out what else it is. You got FM here. Take an antidepressant. Take a painkiller. You're all set. You know, and that's what they're doing now. There are blood tests to roll out other conditions. So they say, well, we don't know what's wrong with you, but we'll run, make sure you don't have any weird infections or parasites or any other type of problems. So the medical approach is pain relievers, right? If you got pain, what do they give you? Pain right. If you have inflammation, they give you. Right. If you, have a, if you are depressed, what do they give you? Antidepressant, yeah, right? So they're treating symptoms, right? No one's looking at the cause. No one's saying, God, why do all these people like, you know, have fibromyalgia? Are they making it up? How many people have people, how many people know people like we already started with, FM, where the doctors have told them it's on your head? Here, take, you're, you need to go see a psychiatrist. Why do I want to see a psychiatrist? I got pain. Well, just talk to them, you know, whatever. They, they, they all think it's like a lot of times they think it's a mental condition. There's probably a mental component to it, especially if there's an endocannabinoid system problem. There's definitely a brain component, but it doesn't mean that the people are all crazy. Some of them might be. I don't know. But, I mean, they're not all crazy. You know, they have some deficiencies and neurological problems. They need some help, big time. Okay? Physical therapy, chiropractic is great. Occupational therapy, counseling, because you've got to throw it in there, because there usually is a mental component or a psychological component to it. Stress reduction, sleep, exercise, massage. Uh, it's, massage is very interesting. There. A lot of my patients by FM can't get massages. Welcome. It hurts too much. CBD Expo. Then other ones get it and they feel amazing. So what do you think my recommendation is? We are going to play CBD Feels bingo. good, do it, right? I mean, you know, like, why not? You know, anti-inflammatory diet. This is a big one. I'm also a certified health coach. Um, I have an InBody 570 in my office, which is like a $10,000 FDA-approved body composition machine. I do tons of work with, you know, I mentioned earlier, caloric restriction, intermittent fasting. Uh, you got to look at diet with people big time. Most people eat a very pro-inflammatory diet. It creates a lot of nasty problems. You know, I, we already mentioned chiropractic, acupuncture, things like that are great. Um, so how can CBD help? So let's go back now, and we're going to say, uh, we learned all this stuff about the endocannabinoid system, how CBD functions, but... How can it affect someone with just FM? And does it only affect people with FM? This is like the whole point of my talk, the gist, I hope you guys are getting, is that we can't pigeonhole CBD as treating diseases. Testing, testing. Then it's a drug. We have to look a little bit more globally. We have to look at it and say, the brain isn't processing well. The brain isn't working. It's not healthy. It's not doing what it should do. Because of that, we take CBD and it allows our brain to function better than the brain takes over and heals stuff. Right? If we keep saying, okay. I have cancer, oh, CBD's good for that. I have FMO, it's good for that, whatever. It's a drug at that point. And it makes it very easy for pharmaceuticals and everyone else to say, you're right, you're 100% right. We're going to do research that shows that CBD helps with cancer, now it's a cancer drug. Now we got, we'll take it over from here. We have to be very careful what we do with CBD. And the FDA and the USDA, even right now, they say, well, you can't say that CBD helps with cancer. I could show you tons of, of studies, but I'm not allowed to say that it cures cancer or does something specifically because the FDA has not approved that yet. So again, we have to be very careful in that realm of what we say. But we can discuss studies and talk about it. That's great. That's what they're there for. But we can't validate 100% until the FDA gives it a stamp. And who do you think gets all the stamps? Pharmaceuticals, right? How many ways are there to reduce blood pressure and cholesterol? The five chair. I mean, think of how many there are, really. I mean, does diet, nutrition, exercise, does that help? Right. Well, good luck. The only way you can like, really say it is the medications that are specific for it have been proven in studies to lower whatever. So you might exercise and your blood pressure might drop off, your cholesterol drop, you feel great and healthy, but you really can't advertise it that way because only pharmaceuticals have the right 
to actually say that what they're doing or what they're giving you has a specific medical you know, end to it, the change end. So um, remember, the CB1 receptor, mental psychological component, CB2 affects inflammation and pain. Ah, FM people, don't we have possibly a psychological nice problem there? Don't we also have a pain and inflammation problem? Is this difficult or no? Kind of straightforward? Okay. Cannabidiol, cannabidiol, that's your THC. And there are combinations act as peripheral analgesics in a rat model of myofascial pain. Basically saying down here, yes, CBD helps with myofascial pain. I'm sorry you can't read it, it's not, it's not dark enough in here. Uh, clinical endocannabinoid, deficiency reconsidered. Current research supports the theory in migraine, fibromyalgia. Oh, wow, well, look, it's starting to come out here. This is 2016. The research is there, it's coming out more and more all the time. Um, this is, whoops, this is what I'm going to try to get to come up. Actually, it's a little bit more difficult from here. Oops, no, I don't want that to happen, do I? Hold on. Slight technical difficulty. Okay. Um, I had to do that because you can't get the pages to come up right. Anyway, this is kind of neat. In treatment approach, this is an abstract that was done. And it was actually a survey monkey, which is kind of neat. And they said, among the patient conditions, patient reported relief from CBD. Uh, back pain, 63% of people <laughs> with back pain, 63%. Nerve pain, 38%. Jeez. Neck pain, 38%. Migraines, 30% of people with migraines get relief. In, in this survey monkey, not a study, survey monkey, but if you ask the people with the problems, they're going to tell you if something's helping or not, right? Limb pain, you know, not spinal limb. Fibromyalgia, about 20%. Another, about 20%. Okay? 20% is still huge. Don't kid yourself. It's still great, all right? So when we're looking at that and we're seeing, yeah, this is a survey monkey asking people, I'm diabetic. I am diabetic, insulin dependent. I love taking CBD, it helps my diabetes a ton. I have studies I can show that it actually increases receptor site activity so my insulin doses are less. It also helps with, with converting white adipose to gray adipose. For those of you who don't know, it actually converts fat into basically functional fat, which you can then burn. Pretty cool, right? Neat stuff. I'm not gonna wait for studies to show this 300 times over. I know what it does in my body. I would respond to that in many positive ways, but I can't advertise what I just said. But if, you're if you know someone who's diabetic, CBD might be very, 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 very good for them. Actually, I can tell you it would be very good. Okay. How can CBD help with other pain diseases? Yes. All right, so again, here we go right back into diseases again. We're going to take CBD to treat a disease. We don't want to say that, nor really can we say that. Okay? In a similar fashion to fibromyalgia, CBD can improve the function of the, of the receptors, improving the brain function and the immune response to pain conditions. We're going to go in a loop on this because that's essentially what's happening. Forget the disease. the disease. The disease is a result of something not working right. Do we agree on that? If you have cancer, you know, most people aren't born with it. You, know. you develop cancer. What is actually happening with most forms of cancer in the body? Is everyone in here have cancer? I would say yes. And every single person in this room at this second has probably one or two or more cancer cells. But your immune system identifies those cells as not being healthy and it eliminates them, right? That's the way our immune system is supposed to work. But what happens when the immune system gets a little confused and it doesn't know healthy cells from unhealthy cells? What happens with those cancer cells? They build. And then you get tumors and you get all types of other problems. That's essentially what's going on. It's basically a confused or a non-functional or improperly functioning immune system. What does CBD affect? Does it affect the immune system? Interesting, right? Can CBD cure cancer? You better not say it. But there are some great studies now on two specific lines of breast cancer that clearly show that CBD actually kills, kills the breast cancer. But you can't go out there and say it, even though it's right in the studies. So I'm saying there's, and there are a lot of other studies, and I have a whole database on studies you know, with, with, with the cancer and the CBD. You can't say it yet until the FDA gives it a stamp, but hey, let's improve how the brain and the body works. And by doing that, it's pretty amazing how the body can take over, okay? This is a little bit more just on FA that I put in here from one of the studies that I'm getting into in a second. Uh, FA is therefore an attractive drug target. Remember, that eats the anatomide. Treating pain, anxiety, depression, although recent clinical trials with FA inhibitors were unsuccessful. That's interesting. They're trying to create drugs, 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 drugs that inhibit FA, but they're not having success with that. But yet we know that if our own body or CBD eliminates FA, then we're going to work pretty well. Because everything has to be done by a drug route. Why not just let the body work naturally? And some amazing things can happen. So let's take a look at some common pain diseases. Low back pain, arthritis, headache, 
MS, fibromyalgia, sh you know, shingles, uh, you know, uh, nerve damage, and here's another list of them. I mean, how many in people in here have something? Pain base, right? I mean, it's like, how many, what percentage of our population? I mean, if you look up here, I can't see the number, it's too late, but it's what, 780, 80, 787 million searches when you type in, you know, how many hits? Common pain diseases. My God, it's huge. What does it say over here? A pain disorder. Pain disorder is chronic pain experienced by a patient uh, in one or more areas and is thought to be caused by psychological stress. That to me is like cop out. I'm a chiropractor. Come on. So you're telling me all these pain disorders are because people just are mentally ill. There's a problem. What's that? I guess if I was frustrated and I couldn't figure thing, like out ways to, to help people, I'd say it's on their head too, right? It's not in my head. Because if it was in my head, I'd be able to fix them. <laughs> so you know, it has to be in their head, but they can't fix it. So I don't know. I have a real problem with that, though. Um, again, you can't see the bottoms here, and I do apologize. It's just a little bit too light over here. Um, basically. You know, cannabidiol prevents, uh, cannabidiol prevents pain and nerve damage in rat osteoarthritis. We know it helps with osteoarthritis. Uh, pain providers, uh, you know, take, I mean, you guys can take a look at this. Another one, uh, opiates, opioids. I'm on a panel tomorrow, I'll be talking about that. Uh, so all these different things that are chronic pain, arthritis, wear and tear, FM. Uh, here's another one, Can cannabinoids, a new approach for pain control. I mean, you know, current review, that's a brand new study. That one is a 2019, current opinions of uh, oncology just fresh out, like, oh, maybe we should be using this stuff. But we can't say we're going to use it yet because the FDA, you know. But it, it, there's a lot of validity and a lot of studies coming out. We are in the right place at the right time, and we're leading everyone in this, and it's wonderful. All right, I want everyone now, this is like the fun part of my talk. Is everyone here falling asleep? I'm falling asleep. Is anyone else falling asleep? Anyone bored? No one's bored? I failed. All right, everyone take off their CBD hat. Who here likes Marvel? DC Comics, fine. I'll let you stay in the class. Anyone here like Marvel? All right, great. You know what X-Men are or Inhumans? Mutants? What do we think of someone who's mutant? What, I mean, if you think of a mutant or an inhuman, I can't believe I'm talking about Marvel on a stage here. But anyway, that's right. I'm, going with, I'm going with this because it works. You'll see why. You'll be like, what is this guy going? Genetics. Something is different with these people, right? Something is working different so they get superpowers, like superhero powers, OK? So you know, this is like really cool. I want you guys to think about this, OK? If you're an X-Men, what attributes would you want? Super strength. What's that? Super appetite, super digestive ability, super feet so you can fly. You know, you want all these different things, right? Like, what did I really want? But we have to bring it back to Earth just a little bit, OK? So let's just say you chose this list, which I think is kind of cool. I felt no pain. So you're a person that cannot experience pain. So you hurt yourself, you look at it, you go, ooh, and then a couple hours later, fine. Um, I don't have any anxiety, fear, depression. I never feel sad. I'm always happy. It's relative. And I'm sure if someone like runs over your mom right in front of you, you're going to feel sad for a little bit, but you don't experience depression or anxiety. Well, what did we say at the beginning? One in six Americans are on, on psych, uh, psychotropic drugs? Was it 52 million people? Imagine if 52 people, literally, 52 million out of 52 million couldn't do that. Think about the amount of dollars saved to our healthcare industry by that alone. Hmm. So you'd be very mentally stable. What if you healed incredibly fast? You get a surgery done and you healed in about one third to one fifth the time of everyone else. But the regulation. Anyone sound like Wolverine in here? Except he's mentally ill. But anyway, uh, you know. But you see where I'm getting. You see where I'm getting with this? I think you see where I'm shifting over. Okay. And you don't need pain medications. Ever. You hurt yourself, you get better. You don't get headaches. You get no problems at all. Is that humanly possible? No one in here would say yes, right? That's impossible. Like, come on, you're you're talking about an X man or an inhuman. This is definitely impossible. That's not possible, right? We can agree that this would be like really cool, right? What system would need to be affected to get you to that point of being an inhuman or an X-Man or whatever? What system? All those things I discussed, what would have to be affected? Your endocannabinoid system would have to be working at a tremendous level, probably not humanly possible, although it is, but at an incredible rate to get this almost inhuman response. The question is, is it possible? Has there ever been a case of this before? Meet Joe Cameron. <laughs> Amazing, it just popped up on the slide. How's that possible? <laughs> uh, Joe Cameron's a 71-year-old woman from Scotland. Um, she's immune to anxiety and pain. She doesn't feel much, if any, pain ever. She heals incredibly fast. Okay, This is her. She has a genetic mutation. Guess what? 
She's a hyperactive endocannabinoid system. If you're ever going to talk to anyone at all, this is a case study. Okay, I'll show you the study on it. It has not been published yet. It's coming out. I, got it. I get it early because uh, I, I get a lot of, do a lot of research. 70-year-old old woman, you can read down here, identified a new mutation in a woman who's barely able to feel pain or stress after surgery, baffled by her recovery and operation. I mean, this woman literally got a hip replacement and thumb surgeries and like no painkillers. It was fine. Recovered tremendously fast. Does that mean she didn't get arthritis? She got arthritis. But she heals incredibly fast from it. It's amazing. You're going to see some other really cool stuff right out of the study on this. Okay? So let's take a look. Circulating concentrations of anatomide were increased by 70% and PEA. Anyone know what that is? Palmitoethanolamide. Uh, that's another one. By the way, if you're into product formulation, PEA is huge as an entourage effect with your CBD, just to let you know. Uh, tripled. The concentrations of 2-AG, another endocannabinoid, eh, that was in, you know, un or, you know, unaltered. Levels are consistent with FA having significant loss of function in the patient. Guess what? She doesn't make FA. What have I talked about the whole time? This is the study. Okay? This is the actual study. Microdeletion in a FA pseudogene identified in a patient with high anatomite concentrations and pain insensitivity. If the, I guarantee you if the military could figure out this particular gene defect and, and perfect it, every soldier would have it. You get shot, you'd heal rapidly. You wouldn't feel any pain. It's like, and it's literally a mutant trait. I mean, it's, a, it's absolutely amazing though. The only down, downside to it is she gets short-term memory, loss of, of memory. So I get short-term loss of memory too, but I just don't have all those other benefits, unfortunately. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but pretty amazing stuff. Super high levels of anatomide. What do we learn about anatomide? It activates the receptors, right? So this person has it un uncontrolled. And all of us, we don't have enough anatomide. We have too much pho. She's got no pho. She's got all the anatomide, right? We have all the pho and none of the anatomide. So she's got it great in this regard. Super high levels of anatomide, lots of CBD1 and CB2 activation. Low levels are not even functioning pho at all. Tremendous anti-inflammatory, anti-pain effects. You're going to see this in a second, especially on the, psycho on the psychological side of things. Take a look at this. On the generalized system from the study, all right, she's, she's talkative and happy with an optimistic outlook. I would too if I didn't feel any pain or have any anxiety, stress, or anything else, wouldn't you? How optimistic would, it, would you feel if you've never had pain and have never been felt stressed before or been unhappy? Your whole life would be different because this is the crap we got to deal with. I mean, she was involved, one of the stories they talk about, she's involved in a bad car accident. She somehow gets out of the car almost like unscathed, even though she's like, like really damaged, goes and checks on the person like hit her. And, like, and, she, and they're like, what is wrong with you? And she's like, oh, I'm fine. And like, well, it's just like, it's, it's off the charts. Generalized anxiety disorder, seven question, eight anxiety questionnaire, medical testing, taken at age 70, zero out of 21. They have to call it mild. They can't call it zero. If they just call it mild, she's got none. Okay, let's just be honest here, zero. All right, likewise, patient health questionnaire nine for depression. This is what they give people. Who here's had one of these? Well, don't tell me. If you go into your doctor and you get psychological profiling done, whatever, for depression, zero. That's mild, because everyone's got something wrong with them. No, zero, she's got nothing wrong. Okay, she's blanked. It's amazing. She reported long-standing memory lapses, you know, forgetting words, missing a placement of keys, eh, whatever, she's 70. I'm not too worried about that. That might be an effect, the downside of the genetic mutation, but she's functioning fine and working pretty darn well, okay, with everything else. Um, she also reported never panicking, not even in dangerous or fearful situations, such as in a recent road traffic accident. No pain, no inflammation, no anxiety, no depression, all due to what? A hyped up endocannabinoid system. The rest of us in this room, our, our endocannabinoid system is barely even working. We gotta get that CBD and we gotta get things working in here. So, sounds a little bit on the superhuman side, doesn't it? But it's real. Okay? We don't all have this micro deletion genetic mutation, but we can buffer our ECS. And by doing so, what happens? If we get our endocannabinoid system to work better, we're naturally raising up those levels as an on demand system. And guess what? We can function and heal faster and have less depression, less anxiety, and everything else. So, are we treating a disease? Are we just doing this to treat FM or a pain disease by name? Or are we doing this to have the brain function at a more optimal level so that everything works better? This woman is a perfect example of everything working better. Except she loses her keys. Okay? So there we go. So instead of looking at it that way, let's look at the effect of the ECS. I think that's very important for us. Like education, take one gem out of this. Don't use FM to free, to, I mean, don't use, excuse me, CBD as disease. Look at it as improving the brain so your body can heal itself better. That woman's the perfect example. That study is like the absolute. I think it's great. So I'm going to thank all of you guys for coming this morning, afternoon now. 
Um, you know, I hope you guys all learned something. Again, I'm with Noetic Nutraceuticals. We're down there. Our little slogans are only the best for the best you. Products with a purpose. I'm a formulator. Uh, we do a lot of nanotechnology and a lot of other really neat things that are really cutting edge in the industry. Um, and I hope you guys learned and had a good time. Okay. Thank you.